And welcome to EMS Underground. I am the Rock Out of Podcasting, Charles McFall, and I'm here to let you ask a medic anything. This is a show that I do here on this channel. I know I'm looking past the camera, but I'm trying to set some stuff up. But this is the show I do here on this channel every Thursday afternoon around 2.30 Eastern, and we're just about right on time today. So the topic I want to talk about is piss poor planning, man. And actually, Nicole, this is your story that inspired me on this uh, to talk about with being in the medicine and training and just piss poor planning. And the, it, it comes all oh, – oh, Jesus. It seems to come down to – no, I did not get a haircut. Um, this is my, my – I'm busy and I haven't done my hair today look. So – uh, thank you, Laura, for asking. And I don't mind. I'm, I'm actually saying it's cool. Uh, so normally I have like a nice you know, mohawk and this and that and the other. But I got a shower last night. And normally I'll do my hair in the morning. And then it'll stay for a while. And this morning I just got right out of bed. Had to take the kids to go somewhere. Came home. Got right into Rock Got a Podcasting, which you can find at Rock Got a Podcasting on Facebook. And did that episode uh, today. And then got a quick lunch. And now I'm right back into doing EMS Underground. So, uh, I was talking to my buddy, Douglas Spencer, who is married to the world-famous Nicole Spencer, who is in the chat rooms here quite often. And he was telling me about how they went to the the training center, the National Training Center. Now, before we get into all of that, because it's not really about their story, it's about what we can learn from this story, and just communication and planning, man, communication and planning, and and just pausing for a minute and this can apply to any ems call this can apply to any bureaucratic situation because even now in newton county right we've talked about piedmont said uh, they came in about the hospital which runs the ambulance service and they came in and said well we're not going to do that anymore so we want someone else to take it over and now you've got the government working with well, working being the political term here, because I don't know how ugly or unugly it is getting. But working being, uh, you got the government working on it, you've got uh, the hospital entity working on it, and you got all these private services. And then, of course, you got the citizens all worrying about whether or not they're going to have EMS coverage. This, what I'm going to talk about today, can apply to all of those situations. Okay, it can really apply to your everyday life, but I'm going to keep it to EMS and, and those kind of things. Um, my Chris Wisdom's messaging me something. I don't know what. Uh, so Douglas Spencer told me about going with Nicole here. They went to the National Training Center in Maryland. So Douglas, I've known Douglas for 20 something years now, a little over 20 years, I think. And the last easy decade, if not more, he's really been on fire for working in this community, uh, doing um, fire, EMS, those kind of things. He went and got his EMT numbers, so he's an official EMT. He was a first responder before that. He was a volunteer fire chief. Then he became what I call super chief, which he's over all the volunteer chiefs answer to him. Now he's uh, part of uh, – he is the volunteer uh, EMA director, emergency med- uh, management um, administration director. And he's volunteer because it's a government position. He already works for the government. It'd be a conflict of interest to have two paying jobs from the government. Uh, so he, do, he actually does that for volunteer work. And, I mean, he put himself through EMT school, did all that, got his numbers. He's always going to fire school for this or that. You know, he's a fully trained firefighter. I don't know what level, but he's he's got a bunch of levels. He's got fire chief stuff. He's done all this great stuff. He knows how to line up training is what I'm saying. He knows how training should go, and he knows families are always included. And before you pick it apart, yes, part of the communication is he didn't call up there and say, hey, I'm bringing my wife. But that doesn't excuse the rest of this. The rest of this is the, the illustration of what horribleness can happen when we don't talk to each other. We don't communicate with our firefighters, as I'm talking from a medic standpoint, when we don't communicate with our partner on the truck, when we fail to communicate with our superiors or with the people who have the bigger picture than we do, 
when we stop listening to patients and think we know what they're doing, and all of a sudden there's conflict, we're like, why is this so hard? Why is this so difficult? It's because there's a failure to communicate. Well, if that's the way he wants it, he gets it. Yeah. <laughs> Name that movie. Great movie. I know the song. I'll give you the song. Civil War, Guns N' Roses, 1990-something. But uh, 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 here's the thing. So the short, the, the, the version that he tells me is he says it's a nice ride. It's about a 10-hour drive. It's him and this other guy going to training. I'm not sure where the guy is from. Did I mention he works for the government? He has clearance, like legal government background checked clearance. I don't know what level, but he has a – he out basically he outranks everybody at the school in my in my understanding, and I think the guy going with him might be a firefighter. Maybe Nicole can clear it up. I'm not sure if they're both firefighters going and Nicole was coming because she's the wife, or if they both work in the government and they're going to. I, I don't remember why, but they're going to this national training thing, and it starts off at home. I don't mean like literally at home, but I mean home in Georgia, where. Oh, he's the assistant chief. Okay, that's the part I didn't ask him. Thank you, Nicole. The other guy was the assistant chief. So two volunteer firefighters with clearances and all this other stuff that they need to have, blah, 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 are trying to go to the National Training Center. And, Carl, this is the, the story I was kind of referring to the other day when I called you. So you're going to get kicked out of this. So you have to call Georgia training the, the gyp stick or, or the training coordinator or something because it has to be it was something about being sponsored it wasn't that re, it wasn't that important to the story so i kind of skipped over a bloop, 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 skipped over that part when he was telling me the story uh but basically he can't just call in this scenario he didn't just call up to the national thing say i want to sign up for this class done he had to go through the georgia coordinator and he had asked for two different classes you know trying to get in just one for the weekend and it's only a weekend but he's trying to get into one of two different classes. Well, he didn't get into either. He got assigned to a third class that he never cared about. He could have just taken it here at home. You know, all this stuff. Well, okay, whatever. And he was actually told by personnel somewhere in the chain. is where I'll leave that story. He was told by personnel, oh, it doesn't matter about the classes. It's about the experience. It's about just going up there and seeing everything. It's like, no, communication failure number one, you're not doing your job. When people are coming to you for an education and they ask you for said education, your job is to get them that education, never to say, oh, no, the classes don't matter. You just go up there for the experience. Really? So the the clinicals that we have don't really matter at the school. You're just, you're just there for the experience, for the vibes that you get from being inside the school. Yeah, man. You know, there is a theme running here in the last couple of weeks of, of some negativity, for sure. So last week, we talked about bad preceptors, and that is a problem. Lack of communication and failure to understand you're unimportant is a massive problem with paramedics and EMTs. We're called paragods sometimes, right? Paramedics, you think they know everything. We call them paragods. Rescue Randys, the guys who get out there who are volunteers who think they knew everything, and they're just bungling everything up. You know, the middle EMT, I don't know what we call EMTs who think they know everything, but I'm sure there's some term for it. Firefighters, you know, su- you, I call them super chief out of love of my heart, but you could call somebody super chief negatively if they think they know everything. But here's the thing. What we have to understand, we're in a service industry. As paramedic, we are here to serve the public to help, even if it is a three in the morning stomach ache call for somebody who just really didn't want to be in that house anymore and need to go somewhere else or they've their dts have kicked in because they haven't had a drink in a day or two or um no no Laura, it wasn't all about the vibes last week i'm just saying we have a theme of negative vibes because last week we were complaining about bad preceptors and bad experiences with people who teach you uh so <laughs> you can go back and watch that this week i'm talking about bad communication but these are things we need to address so I'm just going to go back to my story here. So he goes to the guy, says, hey, we're trying to do this sponsorship. We're trying to get up there. Uh, these are the classes we'd like. It's just, oh, my God. No, the classes don't matter. It's all about, uh, really, we're going to drive 10 hours. 10 hours across. I'm not going to count in my head. 
but let's say 10 states. Because from Georgia to Maryland, to the National Fire Training Academy, or the fire, National Training Center, whatever it's called. No, you're not going to, you're not going to, oh, yeah, the vibes. Yeah, I saw, okay, so a little side note, uh, Laura went to Colorado, or somebody, somebody saw, I think it was you since you're mentioning it, but basically it's a, it, the card says a little pot from Colorado, and it's, it's this little thimble size bowl that looks like, you know, pot. it's, it's a nice play on words because it legalized weed, it's funny, I like it. Anyway, so he gets assigned to a class. It actually turned out to be a decent, okay class, you know, but he gets assigned to it. And him and Nicole and assistant super chief, whatever he is, they drive up there. And he says it's a fun trip. Everybody's having a blast. They get to spend some time uh, doing different things and doing stuff. So they get there. And at some point on the way up there, the assistant chief looks at him and goes, um, well, do you have a contingency plan for if they don't let her on campus? He's like, what? What do you mean don't let her on campus? Well, I've never taken anybody up there. I'm not really sure how that's going to go. And I'm thinking the same thing he was thinking, or what I assume he was thinking was, he's going to a number of classes at Gypstick here. That's the Georgia. We've gone through the the uh, anagram there, but it's it, the the training, all the training for police and fire and EMS in Georgia. It's a big academy in Forsyth. And, yeah, he's done, a, oh, God, I'm, I, I've lost count of how many classes he's done. I've lost count of how many times he's taken his wife. I think, Nicole, you've even taken Lanty, your daughter. I know you know it's your daughter, but everybody else for them to know it's your daughter. I think you've gone with the whole family up there, and it's just here's here's the single guy bunks, here's the married guy bunks, Right. And, you know, married guy bunks have more like a hotel room because it's a family. Single guy bunks is more like a bunk room with bunk beds and open space and whatever. And so, never had a problem, right? I mean, I don't know if he had to pay a little extra. I really don't know. I just know that it's never been a problem. So, he didn't even think about it. And he said he wasn't sure uh, because I did ask him because that's who I am. I'm not going to let my friends slide on the stuff I teach here by no means. So after he told the whole story, we had laughs and yells and all this other feelings about it. Uh, I asked him, I said, okay, my one question is, when you thought Nicole was going, why didn't you want to either sign her up for a class or, because she's a firefighter as well, she could easily go to this thing, or at least call and say, hey, I'm bringing my wife, what's the deal? How do I get a, a room for that? And his thing was, well, you know, we didn't think she was going to get to go. We weren't sure she was going to be able to go. I'm like, and Nicole, this is really on him, but it's on you too. And so here's just a little tip. And then, but, but you know, she might not go. And then, well, we'd have to cancel the, the, and then. You see, there is no, oh, yeah, no, you're right for this. Call, put her in a class. If she doesn't think you get to go, you cancel the class. Statistically, there are bunches of people. I was going to say dozens, and it could be more than that. There are bunches of people who don't show up for these classes. It's a statistic reality. It is rare to have a 100% turnout on any class you ever do. People have to cancel all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons. So her not being able to go is no excuse for not calling. So that's where his fault lies, and that's the last of his faults right there. So he's on his way up there, and I know him. He easily, no worries, we'll get a hotel, but, but come on. So he, sure enough, he says, <laughs> I will tell the story a little bit like he tells it. They pull up to the uh, uh, guard shack. He said the low-rent guard shack, the super secret low-rent guard shack with a minimum wage security guard sitting there. And, of course, they ask for IDs, and all three of them pull out their IDs, and you hand it in, and then the guard comes back. He's gone for a minute. He doesn't say anything. He's just gone, and he comes back, and he's like, uh, I got to check it on the list. You guys need to go over here, park in this gravel parking lot. And communication faux pas number two. So, the, number one was the the coordinator, wrong agenda, wrong idea, wrong person for the job, wrong. You're not hooking people up to educate. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a freaking firefighter vacation, man. It costs money to drive up there. It costs time. Now, the way Douglas phrased it was it sponsored, so it sounds like it's a give back to the firefighting community to do these classes. 
So it sounds like he didn't have to pay for that part. I don't know. But it, if he did, they'd have given us even more money. And these are some of these classes are classes he can just take, like he said to me, at home, locally, even online. No, I know. No, 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 no. I know, Nicole. We're getting to that point. We're getting to that point. I just meant before. She's talking about, uh, in the chat room there, she's talking about uh, they tried to get her in a class. No, 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 no. Don't skip ahead. Let me tell the story. Even though it's your story. It's mine now. I'm telling it. <laughs> so, faux pas number two is security guard didn't even ask, is everybody here having a class? What's the deal? Human being to human being. Oh, uh, I, I got to check another list. Park over here. So they park over there. I am a sorry thief, but, you know, that's what I do. It's a teaching moment. I'm teaching, damn it. <laughs> so human being factors goes out. And I want to take a, a, a point right here and tell you and enforce you the number one problem in EMS, the number one problem in firefighting, the number one problem in police, sheriffs, protecting of the, the community. We forget we're dealing with with human beings we let the human being factor fly away there was a recent shooting or at least it was in the news recently no no there's a recent shooting where um, a Somali there's a big Somali community up north somewhere I forget what city and this is the first Somali person, I don't know if he's born in the U.S. or or if he's an actual straight-up first-generation immigrant, but he's the first Somali person in the U.S. to be, I guess, he had to be naturalized, right? But he got to be a police officer on this force. And him and his partner get called to a possible sexual assault in the back line. This is just the details I've heard. It could have changed. My point is the reactions. And they're driving down the back alley looking for this possible sexual assault. Supposedly, don't have any of their cameras on, body cams or dash cams, supposedly. Don't have their alley lights on or anything, supposedly. That's how the story was being reported. Uh, Hear a loud noise, and all of a sudden, this lady appears at the driver's side window. The Somali, this celebrated, first-of-his-kind, honor force guy, is in the passenger seat. The woman shows up on the driver's side. He pulls his pistol, shoots across his partner through the window. Now, I don't know if it's open or closed. Either way, it's bad. Shoots across his partner, killing the lady. Human factor. Human factor. You almost killed your partner. You definitely killed a victim. Who by so far, yeah, I think she's the lady who had called 911. Thank you, Laura. We kill people because we fail to treat them as human beings. Doctors misdiagnose things because they fail to treat people as human beings. They get pissed off that they smell or whatever, it, that they're assholes, that they're biting or spitting. I'm not saying those things are right. I'm saying our job as medics and EMTs and firefighters, police officers, doctors, nurses, anybody who gives back to the community, is to treat the human being. And sometimes there's a medical problem because of the emotional and spiritual problems, right? I I got called to a lady who kept having chest pain, and she kept having chest pain, and she had nitro pills, she had a history of it. Every time we showed up, her EKG was fine. But she kept feeling pain because she was lonely. And no, I'm not saying she had a broken heart and misunderstood misunderstood it. I'm saying she was lonely and just wanted somebody to talk to. And that was coming out through physical chest pain for her. Not saying there's nothing wrong with her heart, but there was nothing emergent happening that even a doctor needed to see at that point. But we treated her like a human being. We started coming by once a week to check on her. Uh, we told her, because uh, she could get out some, we said, hey, if you ever have your caregiver or a person who drives you around, whatever, uh, here's our address, come by and, and see us. And she did sometimes. She'd come by and see the crews and talk. And, you know, we treat her as a human being. So, going back to the security guard, didn't treat Douglas or Nicole as a human being. Because a human being to one to the other said, hey, uh, I only see two of your names on the list. 
am I missing something? And they would even say, no, she's not in a class. She's my wife. She's traveling with me. I'm here for the class. She's going to be. And then they would have said, okay, well, we don't have her list. We can't. We have to find out what to do. That's a human factor. That's the human being thing to do. That's the professional right thing to do. But what happened was, instead, he found another list, didn't find her on it, comes out in an authoritarian manner, according to the story, and saying, oh, you know, I only have two of you on the list. I don't have her on the list. We have a problem. You s- words, words mean things. So if you say we have a problem, guess what we have? A problem. And if you say it in a way that treats me like crap, guess what we really have? A big problem. And Douglas says about that time, uh, some other coordinators started coming across gravel a lot, and this and that and the other. was a. He said, I think this is a guy he's kind of dealt with before and, and had dealings with. Doesn't treat people well. And this is a guy that's like, what's going on? I heard, you know, there's a mix-up in the class, and this and another. And he's like, no, me and – Assistant super chief over here are going to take a class. My wife is with me so we can spend some time when we're not in class seeing the sites, touring the campus. Is that, oh, you can't do that. No, you, can't, you have to be in a class. Okay. Put her in a class. <laughs> can I use that words with the fingers? Yes, you can. <laughs> words mean things. Um, <laughs> you can absolutely use that. Uh, so put her in a class. Well, you know, you can't just walk on. And my buddy Douglas... He puts the pathetic in apathy. I've told him that a million times to his face because he's a guy who will – I don't know how fatherhood might have actually changed him. But he's a guy that with me, I know he's done it with Nicole, and I imagine this might be his parenting style of – and this is never in a literal sense. This is something he and I have actually shared as a imagery back and forth for a couple of years now of how he does things. Hey, you know what? There's going to be a wall over there. Oh, well, you'll hit it. You'll figure it out. <laughs> Doesn't say, hey, you hit the wall. How can I fix you? Nothing. And, he, and there have been times in my life he let me just bang, bang. And finally, once I woke up, I was like, Douglas, why the hell did you let me hit my head on this metaphorical wall a million times? Well, I figured you'd learn eventually. But I'm literally sitting here asking your opinions, your guidance, your input. Every time I hit the wall, I'm like, oh, my God, I hit this wall. I don't know why. Douglas, what am I doing wrong? What do you think I should do? Should I try this? Eh, you'll get there. Pathetic, man. You put the pathetic in apathy. So I said all that to say, he goes, <laughs> he gets mad. Now, Nicole, you can tell me if he, yeah, I'm sure he is. But you can tell me if he actually got, like, mad visibly on site or if he just gets mad in the story. Because he's also very much a consummate professional. He's also very much a politician-ish. Not a politician. He never tries to get your vote. He never lies to you. But he works in politics because he's a super chief, because he's an EMA director, because he works for the government doing what he does uh, in a in a engineering technical fashion. I, just want, I don't know. I mean, it's not like he's working for a top secret job, but I'm just saying. It's whatever. He's an ultimate professional. So he might not have raged out on the scene, but he's like, Give so put her in a class. Well, you can't do that. You nobody walks on. And he goes, he goes. You're no, no. And he used certain words with me, but I'm sure in the story, he didn't, in the real life, he didn't use them. He's like BS. No, every class I've ever been to at every training center ever, there's always somebody to walk on. Here's where you have to remember, as a paramedic and a firefighter, you are ultimately unimportant as an individual. Your value is in what you are giving to the community. Your value is in the fact that you take pride in your job. You get up every morning, every shift, and you go do your job, and you do it to the best of your ability. That's where your value is. This is never in self-importance. And that came out right here when the guy says back, nobody walks on. No, people walk on. This is that. that. And I even, I even told him, like, statistically speaking, this is the words I would have used. Statistically speaking, you never have a 100% capacity class. Never. Because people inherently, especially in a, a situation like this where you have to drive from st- other states to get here, inherently there's a problem with somebody somewhere. Somebody's sick, somebody's kid's sick, car broke down, you had to fill in a shift, couldn't go, all that jazz. So statistically, you're not full up. And they, he said, Douglas said they still actually had registration open. They still had registration open. 
which I can get why he didn't go to registration at that point. Maybe he didn't know in that point in the story because all this is after everything's said and done, he's back in Georgia. So, uh, man, I kind of wish I had seen that, Nicole, seeing how, how he handled being mad. Uh, but, of course, I, I wouldn't have handled it well because he's my boy. And I have no problems getting thrown off campus of anything. And I have no problems using my words. And that's one of my major skills is I can talk myself into and out of just about everything. So I have you know no problem stepping up on his behalf and, and getting angry and, and saying ugly things. Uh, the, uh, you know, I don't know. Laura, see, I got a good point. Could they have gone online and registered by their phone? You know, one of the things I said, in hindsight, it's like, okay, I would have picked up the phone to that goober back in Georgia who said the classes don't matter. I said, you, in looking, the guy who tells me I can't walk in, I looked him dead, and now I'm on the phone going, hey, yeah, I'm having a problem. I need to put my wife in a class, and you got to do it right now. And if you don't do it right now, when I get back to Georgia, I'm going to make my job to sit in your lap until you get your life straight, and you don't want that. And I'm looking dead and eye at the person who tells me I can't. Like, okay, thanks. And then go, no, you're about to get a phone call. She's in a class. You know, that's what I would have done. But I can get this. I can get this, that when you're mad and all of a sudden you're being told. And Douglas is the yin, yin to my yan, right? Or if you're in the South like I am, yin yang, man. Uh, he's my he's a yin to my yang, um, because I'm very passionate, very fiery, very wordy, very. I can connect with people. I can I can. I have taught the cop who was called on me for allegedly child abuse, who responds to a child abuse situation in his mind. I had him laughing with me before we were done. So I get that Douglas is the guy that is born and bred an engineer. He's got the knack. <laughs> he's got he's he can do okay with people for sure he can definitely do okay with people but i'm the people passionate fire guy he's the apathetic cold we can make plans happen we can get shit done oops sorry tom my bad i'm not supposed to say that stuff here uh he can get stuff done and and those are we balance each other uh so i get even me when i get mad it fuels my brain to work faster and to really prove you wrong with my words I can get most people when they get mad. You don't think about everything. I don't even think about everything when I'm mad. I, you know, you'll say, you'll cool off and go, man, I should have said this, or I should have done that, or blah, blah, blah. So I can get why in the situation in another state, you're, and he said, I'll tell you what he said he felt like. Why you're not thinking about, oh, just get on your phone and register. Why you're not calling the guy in Georgia to register. I get that because you're reacting to something. Now, I told you all that about him being apathetic and cold, and, and he's very much an engineer, A to B to C. So he's not prone to exaggeration, as I am. I mean, I'll talk about how I'm the greatest in the world, and this, you know, you expect that from me. He will, he will adequately describe the situation of what he's doing. He felt like his wife was being treated like a criminal. That was the vibe he got. That was how he felt that like his wife was being treated like a criminal. And when you hit that especially in a person who typically is non-emotional, who typically can separate stuff uh, from, you know, how he feels from what he's doing, which makes him really good to work with politicians and, and government workers and all that jazz. That's how he felt. So that's, I get why you don't think, just walk right over registration and have it done. I get why you don't think to get on the phone. Because you are reacting now instead of acting. And that's a hard thing. And that's where we get put behind the eight ball as firefighters, as paramedics. Is we, if we're reacting instead of acting. You walk into a scenario expecting difficulty in breathing. And what you get is, is a domestic dispute. Or attempted suicide. You know, you go to a chest pain call. And it turns out you pass a car that's been demolished against a tree a block away from the house you're going to. And they had walked home and, and called 911 instead of saying they're an MVA. You go to a chest pain call, and when they finally let you pull up their shirt to put on the leads, you see a big stab wound in the chest. Things change all the time, and you have to be tabletop in this in your head. You have to be working these scenarios. And I do that for life. You know, when – the assistant chief would have said to me, what is, what's your contingency plan if they let, let her on? First, you do the rant. What the hell do you mean not let her on? This is stupid. 
But then you go, okay, what if this is a real thing? You know, I start spitballing. Maybe I call them right now. Maybe I see what I can do right now to get ahead of this. Maybe I plan, okay, if they tell me this, I'm going to try this angle, try that angle, let's find out. You know, you spitball it. But most people don't. There's no, Nicole, again, there's no judgment on you or him for any of this. I understand that I am different, but I'm trying to sell my difference into medics and EMTs right now because life changes, and that's what we deal with is life. We say we fight death. There is no fighting death. We deal with life as a business. That's what we do. And it changes constantly. You know, uh, got to take a little drink in my Mountain Dew. Hold on. So back to the story. So he's pissed off. Fine. You know, this and that and the other. Um, and then you can't even get registered. He could not even get registered. He couldn't go in and say, I'm here, get my, my room number. None of that crap. They kicked him off saying, she cannot be here. Here's where the self-importance came in. What do you mean? No, there's always walk-ons. We're the federal training service. Do I look like somebody who's afraid to go to jail? That's that's the literal first thought that popped in my head, putting myself in his shoes as he's telling me this story last night. Is a little first thought is if I'm him and you're treating my wife like she's a criminal and you're refusing to listen. Now, I don't know exactly how the communication went back and forth because, again, none of them are me. So I get that. I'm, I never shut up. I will talk you in circles until you give me what I want. And that's a joke I made to him. I was like, uh, no, I know I've got enough black in me to make the white people give me what, they, what I want. I know how to hit those guilt buttons. I know how to pressure them. And that comes from a comedian I was watching. So if you think I'm racist, I apologize. It has nothing to do with being racist, but it is absolutely there is a way to to make people feel bad about what they're doing. And and this comedian who happened to be black made a joke about that, and I repeated it, and maybe it was in bad taste, and I apologize. Um, but they they kicked her off campus, so she he had to go find a hotel wherever close by, and of course she humanly. I imagine, Nicole, you were blaming yourself and feeling bad, and you're part of the problem because it's all about you. And it's not about you. It was never about you. You did nothing wrong. Douglas did nothing wrong. These self-important people lost sight of customer service. Because how do you train people if you have nobody coming to your school? Because if you keep people treating people like this, Nobody will come to your school because you don't offer, at least in this case, you don't offer anything special. That exact class could have been done online from his house. That exact class could have been done in his area within a few, uh, within an hour drive. And so now you've got him pissed off that they're treating his wife like a criminal. You got his wife embarrassed and upset because she's causing this problem, and none of it is on them. It's on the official representatives who are supposed to be helping our community of public safety. So it goes to registration. After he takes care of her, this and that, he gets back to registration. He says it's about 6.30 or so. And the, I forget how he called it, but basically the minimum wage kid, he absolutely called him a kid, the minimum wage kid behind the desk uh, was he did it. It's funny to hear this guy, my buddy Douglas, who, who again is the opposite of me. So I tell stories. I'm the I'm the C3PO doing the Darth Vader voices, telling the stories to the Ewoks, all that jazz, right? And he never does. He's just like this happened, this happened, this happened, done. And he's like making fun of the kid, going, "No, oh, yeah, so." I mean, doing like the cracking voice and stuff. It cracked me up. But they get told orientation is mandatory, and it starts at seven. They're about to close the mess hall. Uh, so, because the orientation is starting at 7, it's like 6.30. All right, fine, whatever. We'll go out and find dinner later. Man, uh, orientation went until 7.30. So, they skipped dinner to go to something they didn't need to be there for that early. Then it turned out, my headphones keep turning down. I, I play with my headphone cord. I, it keeps turning down my mic volume. Then it turns out that, according to him, and he, again, <laughs> tells me straight, Basically, orientation was don't get drunk and embarrass us. Nothing about dress code for school. Nothing about uh, an event that happened later on in the class where they wanted people to dress up. Nothing about any of that stuff. And so he's he's on top of the way they treat his wife. He's furious. So he says he goes to the class the next morning. And uh, he's he's sleeping off campus, I guess, I'm assuming. Uh, I, yeah, 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 yes. Okay, okay. 
So, of course, he's staying with his wife at the hotel instead of on campus where he was supposed to, well, where he rightfully could be, and she rightfully could be, and they were being nozzles about it. So, they come, she comes to drop him off the next morning, and a new minimum wage security guard is there going, brain season. Uh, uh, uh. He's like, she's dropping me off. We've been through this before. Here's my pass. You're going to let me into my class, but she can't be here. She's not. Li- she's dropping me off. She's, li- I mean, just constant of you can't be here. And my, I yelled this because this is how he and I talk and, and we can both express ourselves the way we do. And I yelled as in my car driving. So it wasn't like right in his ear, but I said, who wants to break in to this training facility? Who in the world gives a crap about the federal training facility that they would break in to steal anything, to kill anybody, to blow up anything? And let me tell you something. The world don't give a crap because here's what would happen. Here's what would happen if there was a mass shooting there. Somebody came in with an AK-47 because you treated their wife like a criminal, and they shot 10 people on campus. The world, the news would go, oh, my God, there's been a mass shooting at the Federal Training Facility in Maryland. Oh, wait, Trump's doing something else. On to new news. Oh, wait, well, there's a report there's been 15 bodies in the death, but Russia is still doing that. They will not care because you are that unimportant. You're that unimportant, but you have to be so secure because you're federal. That somebody can't even drive on campus. Now, here's where it gets worse. So that's still part of the same thing. So he goes to class. And as any teacher does in these kind of situations, as we do at Georgia Institute EMS in orientation, why did you sign up for the class? What do you hope to get out of it? What are your goals? What are you going to do here? How can we help you get what you're here to do there? Um, sorry, I was trying to read. I, I, I was reading something in the chat room here. So he's in the class, and he said, because they're not the only two from Georgia. You know, you can come from all over the state, and Kentucky was there, and probably one or two other states. He said, yeah, a few people from, like, another state, like Kentucky, were like, yeah, I hope to get this out of it, I hope to get that out of it. And when it came to the Georgia people, which there apparently were a number of Georgia people in the class, all of them went, we didn't sign up for this class. We have no idea what you're really teaching about. We got to sign. And the instructor's like, what do you mean? He's like, we asked for other classes. We got told to come to this one. He goes, that's not how it works. He says, well, that's how it worked for us. Nobody, the majority of that class, nobody from Georgia signed up for that class. So going back to Doofenshmirtz over in freaking Georgia not doing his job, the coordinator, and that was a huge problem. And, and it's, it's just evident. So he said things go on, this happens, that happens. At some point, and it might have been the last day, I don't know, but at some point there's a big firefighter memorial there. And, I mean, that was the thing. That was why you go to this school as opposed to just staying home and doing the class. You go to the school to see the, the top-notch facilities they have, to see the different ways to learn, to, to, to see the firefighter memorial, to uh, go to the gift shop, you know, that kind of thing. And, hey, Jeremy, how's it going? We're just, I'm just recounting a friend of mine, a, chief, a fire chief in Oglethorpe, his, his experience with the – training facility, a federal training facility, and really we're using this as a teaching thing too, about communication. So they get, he gets told, hey, we're going to go take the class. The whole class is going to take a picture in front of the firefighter memorial. At lunchtime, you're supposed to wear dress shirts. And he's like, nobody said that at any point in time. Nobody said we're supposed to dress up in orientation, in the class, nothing. So he's wearing like his fire polo or something. Um, he said they get extra time to go to the memorial. So they go there, they take their picture, and he looks over at this grassy area. And there's, he said there's about six women and a good dozen children just running around in the grassy area. And he immediately lost his mind, which is very uh, rare for him. He lost his mind because they all had big red guest pass, passes. And his wife being treated like a criminal, being said she cannot be on campus, we can't have her, you can't get a clap, nothing. For no reason, he loses his his composure, as you would imagine. He just storms over to the registration desk to some other kid. He goes, what the hell is that? Why are there women and children on here when you told me my wife couldn't be? There, how do I get this guest? Where is this red guest? Oh, I, uh, uh, oh, I, I got to call somebody. Then call them and call them now. 
and they call, you know, he called whatever and didn't get anything resolved. Goes to dinner. So class is over for the day. He still has one more day of class or whatever. He goes to dinner. And while he's at dinner, he gets a call. And it's, hey, this is so-and-so, so-and-so. I understand you have some questions. So none of the importance of this is being relayed. None of the story of how badly he's being treated is getting relayed. Communication does not exist at this school or in this school system at all. We have to talk to each other, and we have to listen to each other, and we have to get each other's backs as medics and EMTs. Because if we don't, who will? And you might be there to back up a call for a medic you really don't like, but that's not the point. You have to go beyond that. We have to listen to what our patients are really saying. When our EMT or medic partner blows up on us and reams us a new one, right? And just just maybe even in public and, and just pisses us off. Are they really mad at us? Did what we do really? Was it that bad? Or maybe they're having problems at home. Maybe there's other stuff going on that we can help with. But I say, hey, man, because I've fortunate, been fortunate enough to have people be patient with me. My wife is one of them. That I can go off on something, just yelling at her and just uh, lose my mind for a minute. And she'll call, she'll let me do that. And she will she will say, okay, you know, what's going on? Because that's obviously not enough for you to go crazy about. And, I, I, you know, we can talk about it. Now, BC Dodge says, is that part of being a good EMT communication? It's my understanding that if there isn't good communication, people die. And, yes, but here's the problem. So you get taught a certain level of communication, right? You get taught, hey, say clear when you charge the paddles. You say charging. When it's charged, you clear. You look around, make sure everybody's clear. You say clear again, and you either hit the paddles or you hit the button if it's hands-free. So we're taught that communication, right? We're taught to relay our report, and there's still plenty. Jeremy can attest to this. There's still plenty of medics and EMTs, 20-year veteran medics and EMTs, who cannot give a report to save their life. Horrible reports. But, yes, we're taught legal communication of this is what you tell the doctor. We're taught legal communication of this is what you write in your notes, which might be different than what you tell the doctor because you're writing that for court. And then we're taught to to tell people what we're doing. But at no point in EMT or paramedic school or firefighter school or police officer school, well, maybe at candidate school, I don't know, maybe, we're never taught what's being said may not have anything to do with what's really happening. We're never taught to step back from ourselves and go, Okay, your problem is not my emergency. You know, there is a sign that I've seen in offices. I've definitely seen it in EMS situations. La- piss poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. And we definitely have had situations with medical calls where people are flipping out and they got to go, they got to go. It's like, just because you've definitely been suffering with a broken leg for two days. Doesn't mean we're going to life flight you right this second. It means we're going to try to stabilize it the best we can. We're going to get our IV. We are taking you to the hospital. We're going to get you some medication as best we can to help take some of that pain away. But just because you can't stand it anymore now doesn't mean we're going to change our jobs. But there's a lot of times, as there are seasoned medics, there are great medics who can sit in a truck and the patient or the family's like, My baby, I'm dying. My baby. I-. And you're just like, do 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 IV done. I mean, you just kind of tune it all out, right? And their drama doesn't do anything for you. But the but the thing that will stress the thing that burned me out wasn't the death. It was never the calls that we couldn't change. There was the one that definitely was the the, the straw that broke the camel's back, where the kid was rock climbing all that. I told that. But that was on top of everything else. Because I remember even thinking I'd never get thanked. I never get acknowledgement. Everybody hates me. That's how I felt as a medic for a very long time. Because even the news, when they reported, the local news reported on that kid's death that day, and I saw it, and even the news was like, um, and local nurse, so I'm like, no, 
The nurse, you didn't even mention the firefighters who actually tried to save this kid's life. You mentioned the staff nurse who all she did was let him down. And by the time he was on the ground, the firefighter, and called 911. And yes, that's important. But firefighters showed up. They shocked him twice. Anyway, it was a straw because I felt like every bureaucracy hated me. And this is the point of my story is communicating in bureaucracy, being a human being, connecting as a human being, because that's where our superpowers lie. When you can realize what will make that other person feel better has nothing to do with me. Sometimes it's just holding somebody's hand while you're taking them to the hospital. With the the elderly lady who had the chest pain that I mentioned earlier, it was just somebody being willing to come by and be a part of her life for a second and say hello and check on her. You know, she stopped calling 911 after that. Miraculously, her, her chest pains went away because she had what she needed. And it was never fake. I believe she felt chest pain. I know she has history of heart problems. I know she takes heart medication. But her chest pains stopped because she had somebody giving back to what she needed. And nobody in this story did that with the training school. So it gets better. Well, worse. He's at dinner with his wife in this whole situation, and he gets a call from somebody at school who has no idea what's been going on. Oh, you got some, some questions. And he's, he's had it, right? He's had it up to here. And I'm sure he was curt with her. This boy, this boy does not swear, not really. And I can guarantee you, with his, he's been with the government for before my son was born, so probably looking at 14, 15 years now. He's been working for the government, and that's a job that you never – get to raise your voice or swear in. He's been super chief for probably a decade now. So he's very ingrained in him. No matter, even if I let loose my anger, I professional words. So I'm sure he was curt with her and professional. But basically it was, why is my wife being treated like a criminal when you let other people on the campus? Why can't I get a guest badge? I mean, just blah, 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 blah unloaded. And... She's oh yeah no I'm yeah, oh, sorry we we can definitely yeah she can definitely come on we'll get a badge just you know come on so I don't remember if it's that night or the next morning they show up and <sighs> security guards there and he's like my wife is on the guest list she is coming in with me here's our IDs basically I'm tired of this crap right and the security guard goes to the list you know and here's a big red guest badge and this is the way he tells the story. You will read everything on this card, and then you will sign this paper, and you cannot go into any buildings. And he stressed this point, because this stuck in his craw. Douglas, he stressed this point. And we will be watching you on camera. And to me, he lost his mind at that point. He went and said to me everything that I know he wished he had said then or wanted the ability to say then. Just just yell, cuss this guy up one side, down the other. And I know he didn't do that in real life. But he got told that his wife was going to be watched on camera every step that she took, and he's like, "You can't even go into the the you can't even go into the gift shop next to the memorial to spend money because it's a building and you cannot go into buildings." It, it just it was just horrible after horrible. So he he tried to make the best of it, right? They went and saw the firefighter memorial and they walked around. I mean, he's just he's had now. Here's Here's see here's where communication will get you. People talk. I mean that story took very very short time to go from a personal experience to sharing it with friends, venting to now it's on a show about EMS. About, and I'm using it as this is the worst thing you could ever do. You need to learn to communicate better. This is the tragedy that we teach out of. Story. And who knows where I'll go after this. Maybe somebody will listen to this and they'll tag the National Academy. I don't know. But they've got to get their, their ducks in order. They've got to get their communication right. Because when he finished the class and he went to leave, there's a survey, right? How's the teacher? How's this? And as a teacher, of course, he always makes sure to fill those out, uh, you know, with appropriate marks because he believes, like I do, in good teaching and rewarding good teaching and helping correct bad teaching 
and reporting things that really need to be talked about. And this teacher, apparently the class was fine, the teacher was fine. But it gets down to, is there anything else you'd like to know about, or like, like us to know about? And he, 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 I obviously don't know word for word what he wrote, but he definitely communicated, I have never been treated so horribly in my life. I have been doing this for however many years now. I also work for the government for however many years now. I've been to class on top of class on top of class, federal level and otherwise. I have had it all, and I've never been treated so poorly, so badly. Never had my wife treated like a criminal. Why do you have, why do you advertise in your materials, look at all the awesome stuff we have, come see the facility if you won't let anybody actually see what's going on? I mean, he just wrote it out. And that's good communication. Because here's my last point before we get out of here about communicating inside of EMS and all that jazz. When you have a partner who does bad things on a call, there's a natural human instinct. There's a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a familyhood that is built when you go through stress factors with somebody and you come out on the other side. There's a natural inclination to get their back. But if you don't say something, to them directly. Maybe they have no idea they did something wrong. You would think, you would think you would step back and go, oh my God, how can you not know that's wrong? There's just habits. There's people who don't think it's, it's brain pass. I know a person in my life who will, as hard as he can, segment his life and his brains. So if something happens over here in this job, has nothing to do with anything over here in this job, it has nothing to do over here in his personal life, which is unrealistic, ever. But that's how his brain thinks. So if I tell him, hey, we're going to do this, this, and that, and he and that this is number one that he should tell his per, deal with it in his personal life, the, the second this is what he should deal with in his other job, and that that is what we're going to be doing in this job together. All he hears is that, what we're doing right here together, because I'm not in the business over here, and I'm not in this part of his personal life. And that's a horrible way to be. That is a god-awful way to be where you screw people over unintentionally. But there are people like that, and if you don't say, and I always said something to him, I always did, because if you're unaware of the bad things that you're doing or why they're even bad, it will never change. I had to tell my wife that early on in her marriage, Yes, I should be able to walk past a pile of dirty dishes and go, hey, those are dirty. I'm an adult. I live in this house with one other adult. We're equal. I should wash those too. I, my brain was kid mode. My brain was selfish mode. My brain was I don't give a crap about dishes until they stink mode. Bad mode. But she's like, you should just know this. I'm like, Okay, but you understand. I can agree with you that I should just do this stuff. I'm telling you it's never intentional. It's my brain is in a million different places. And if I don't know I'm doing something that you hate or messing up, how can I change it? Got to get another drink. So at least if your partner is doing something wrong, if you're the medic, try to teach the EMT the right way. Try to talk about this is exactly why we do it safe. And a little bit of effort saves a whole lot of heartache. Um, I was reading an article. Now, we're all adults here. I'm not going to be salacious. But I was reading an article. I saw it's one of those clickbait titles. But um, 10 ways you're using a condom wrong. Something like that. Like, okay, I'm, I'm interested behind the science of what you're talking about. Because I'm a medic. I understand how condoms work and the... STDs and all that jazz. So, like, okay, how, 10 ways you're using a condom wrong. Well, some of them are just stupid. Uh, but the point was, when they talked about taking it out, and if you put it on the wrong way first, you'll instantly know, and here's why. And a lot of people try to flip it and do it the right way. And said, don't do that. Throw it away. And you're thinking, I paid. I mean, these condoms can be expensive. They can be. I mean, you can go to the health department and get some free ones, I'm telling you right now. You can go on most condom makers' websites and order samples for free. Um uh, but, yeah, the, the box of them at the store, it can be expensive. I and mean, when you break it down per item. But they said, okay, even if it's like $2 for that condom, which is super expensive. That's, that's ridiculous if you pay that price. You don't want to pay for raising the child. You don't want to pay for the other options of what happens 
if you do get her pregnant. You don't want to pay. I mean, think about that. $2 to throw that one away, that seems perfectly good. So now you spent $4 to do what you're going to do versus the thousands of dollars, the lifetime of, of whatever, the STD that you get, you know, any of that stuff. And it's a really good point. And that's my point to you is if you don't say something now, the, the fallout you deal with may be way worse. If you're in a situation, the first call I ever ran on a busy truck right after I got my paramedic, I'd, I'd been a paramedic for a month in a small county. I got moved to the bigger city on the busiest truck. Ran a head-on collision where the 15-year-old went into the windshield. Had a fallout with the firefighter on the scene. I mean, basically, just short of physically threw him out of my truck. And there's, I, I think I already told that story, but that's for another time. My point is, I wrote four pages of incident report. Three and a half of those pages were about me and the firefighter. I mean, exactly what I saw when I got on scene, everything I saw and did and whatever. And in the last half of page was my patient report of, I mean, there was some patient report stuff in there, but the wrap up of SOAP, you know, SOAP and a subject, subjective, objective assessment and, um, I think P is like practical, basically what you did. Because otherwise it's just one guy's word against another guy's word, right? Otherwise it's just a thing that blew over and maybe me and him getting into it worse on the next scene we're on together. But because I spent the hour out of service, pissed off after dealing with all that, writing that report, we were able to take it, you know, my, my, all of my superiors said, holy crap, you wrote an awesome report. And then they interviewed me to, to verify some things. And I was, I admitted to the stuff I did and how I handled things poorly. You know, everything was, there was no right, I'm right, he's wrong. It was, no, this is as, as factual as I can possibly be. This is how the whole thing went as, as facts can go. And they were able to take it to his chief and his chief agreed. And the other firefighters on the scene backed it up. And then they were able to sit down and do some education, and that made for smooth sailing for the next two years or so that I was in that service. And I even worked with the guy again a good year later. It was awkward at first, but we talked about it. But because I invested the time to say something, he didn't lose his job. He didn't get suspended. He didn't even get reprimanded. He got reeducated, basically like, hey, here's the bottom line. That ambulance service owns the ambulance license. It doesn't matter that you're a paramedic, and he was. It doesn't matter you're a paramedic for another service, which he was. In our service, even though we do reward you for being a paramedic, we do not have an ambulance license. Therefore, it is their numbers, their livelihood, their butts on the line. If a medic tells you to stop, you have to stop. And he didn't like that. And... You know, I had to learn ways to get along with people. I mean, we both learned stuff out of it. But what happened was we both got an education and went forward. And that's the importance of communication. And that's why I shared this story of the Maryland Training Center. Now, BC Dodge put something in here. The DMV, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, uh, area is special uh, is a special place. Okay, so DMV is D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Gotcha. So not Department of Motor Vehicle. So that that – trifecta area is a special place filled with special people they tend to forget that everyone is from the dmv and not everyone functions the same way and and the problem with that too and i keep trying to relate it back to being paramedics because we can't get this way we think we're better than firefighters there was a huge period of my life where i thought firefighters were stupid i was taught in school firefighters were stupid i had a disdain for firefighters i thought i was better than them because i lost a bit of my humanity I lost focus on what humanity was. I never thought I was better than an EMT, but that's because I had really good instructors to tell, show me teamwork, show me how we get along together. Um, putting federal in front of something means jack crap. It really does. Humanity is humanity. And I watch a lot of apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic stuff, zombie movies, uh, you know, just anything along those lines, you know, Mad Max, you know, stuff. The reality is 
the government works and everything's important right now because the government works. If something were to happen, if four or five years ago the banks had failed, there could have been, there would have been chaos. I'm not sure where it would have gone. What I'm saying is, look at history. Governments fall. Empires fail. Money changes. You know, economies change. The government works right now because it works. When it doesn't work anymore, federal won't mean crap. Paper money won't mean crap. You know, uh, I've got some people in my family who are preppers, doomsday preppers, right? And they've got physical silver and gold stashed. And I'm like, that means nothing. Nobody's going to give a crap about your gold bar if the doomsday world comes about because people want to eat. That's what they want to do. They need to eat and live and be safe. So they want ways to be safe. They want ways to get food. Gold bars and silver coins aren't going to mean anything in a doomsday scenario. And that's what we have to remember. Those numbers on my shoulder that say I'm a paramedic don't mean anything if I miss that connection with with what's really going on with you. If I push away everybody who tries to help me or tries to teach me. So please, please be happy. (laughs) <laughs> Lars says, well, gold is pretty heavy. You could use it at the end of a club. Yeah, you're right there. Um, try your best to never take anything personal in the medical field. Be the person that can get along with nurses. I'm in an EMS humor group, and I get why it's funny, and I do laugh at it, but I never actually mock anybody directly. Uh, but EM, uh, EMTs and paramedics are really big on mocking CNAs and LPNs, especially CNAs. Uh, that's that's a six month. No, it might even be ninety day program. It's a very short program, and you're a glorified butt wiper. That's what a CNA is. Now you might get other stuff to do. An EMT basic. He's a bit of a glorified ambulance driver. You absolutely learn some skills. You absolutely or never just a driver. But there's many levels above you. And there's a very, very low limit to what you can do. That's all I'm saying. My point is, I get why pe- they'll hate on them and this and that. But be the person that goes in and treats nurses as equals, treats CNAs as equals, treats humans as equals. I treat doctors as equals. Now, I'm respectful, and I do understand. They know a whole lot more than I do. But when I talk to them, I talk to them out of confidence that I know what I'm talking about. And I've had one doctor try to yell at me about something, I just turned and walked away because I don't have to take it. He didn't know what to do with that. I didn't yell back. I didn't do anything. I just walked away from him because I don't have to take it. Because you forget just because you're a doctor, and you do know more than I do doesn't mean you're not a human being. When we lose sight of humanness, our own humanness, and connecting to other human beings. Why? I mean, that's a whole other show. i got to stop here, but that's a whole other show. Why are we so afraid to connect to other people? Why is the security guard at the Federal Training Center afraid to just say, hey, I've got two of your names on my first list. Is she supposed to be on a different list? What's going on? Can, can you help me out here? Why is he so afraid of that? Why does he have to say, pull around over here to secure area. I'm going to check another list. And then disappear for a while, not telling you what's going on. And then come out and challenge you. We have a problem. I will never understand that. I will never understand that. And that's the heart of what we do here. We talk about the things that we forget to talk about in class. We teach you the things that will help you not only survive, but to be a better human being, to be a better person, to thrive in doing this job that is tough and can get you down. All right, that's going to be it for today. I am Charles McFall. I am the media specialist here at Georgia Institute of EMS. So please, hey, like this page, follow the live notifications for any time that this on. We try to do this every, we being Tom Campaign and I, Tom runs the school. I actually just talked to him the other day, and uh, he 
he's just got lots of great classes going on. He really wants to get back with the show, but he's got so much going on with the school. It's going really well right now, and it's doing really well. I know we graduated the five-week course. I think we have another, I think it's not five weeks, but I think it's like 10-week course going on right now where it's a very accelerated course for EMTs. I know August 12th we're doing a big national registry test, uh, a physical exam. On August 12th, we've got more classes coming up, uh, ACLS, PAL, CPR, EMTA, EMT Advanced, or EMTB, and EMT Advanced. Sorry. Uh, it's, whatever. Ah, so, yeah, check it all out. That phone number, 678-561-2368, is how you find out more about classes, how you get more involved in what's going on and how you can learn. E-M-S-U at G-A-I, E-M-S dot org. That's the email that you can send topics to me. Let me know what you'd like to talk about. Let me know uh, in the E-M-S field where you, what you'd like to hear about. I love that Jeremy last week gave us the topic of bad preceptors and what to do when that happens. Um, and this week, Douglas Spencer, inadvertently, I didn't even call him for this story. I, I just, it, it, he told it to me last night, and it was perfect for today to talk about. So, there you go. All right. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little something. And I, I you know, go out. As I end my other shows, go out and love somebody and tell you love them. Because I got to tell you, being happy with who you are, loving yourself, will make it so much easier to deal with the crap that we go through in the world. We do. And as public safety, we deal with the lowest common denominator. But that lowest common denominator is still a human being. And I can, I can tell you story after story, if you treat them like a human being, they will act differently for you than they will for everybody else. And I'm talking about the, the habitual callers, the fakers, the, the people who just stop taking their medication so they'll get their way and go to the hospital, the people that we disdain, right? That's me looking down my nose when I rub it that way. When we disdain, but you treat them like a human being, all of a sudden, they work for you and they're a good patient for you and they won't do it for anybody else. And they might literally piss on everybody else. So, all right, do all that stuff. We'll be back. I'll be back next week, Thursday, about 2.30 p.m. Eastern. So, take care. And, Nicole, you're no criminal in my book, darling. <laughs>